Hey, how's it going guys? Captain Cuba here and welcome to another God of War video. The day has finally come, my friends. It has been five months since God of War Ragnarok was released, which means I've had a lot of time to think about my updated ranking of the series. I figured I'd do this video, well, because I needed to include God of War Ragnarok in it, but also because my taste in gaming has changed in the past year, which means my old ranking video doesn't reflect how I currently feel about the series today. Now, I want to say one thing before I start. The topic of ranking games in a series as good as God of War can get heated pretty quick. So please, let's all be respectful of each other's opinions and just be fans of the series we love so much. Yeah, I know you guys are probably gonna fight anyway, so I just needed to say that. One more thing. Before my ranking starts, I'm gonna ask you to leave your ranking in the comments section below. It helps the channel and I'll get to see lists that aren't inspired by me in any way. So with that out of the way, here's my updated ranking of the God of War series. You know when people say that ants are the strongest animal in the world, and you're like, how can that be? Ants are so tiny, I can easily squish it. Well, people say that because in relation to their body size, they can lift things that are way more, you know, heavy than we can, or whatever. Well, if we apply that same logic, then God of War Betrayal is the best game of all time. Because having this game restricted to only be released on mobile phones in 2007 came with some drawbacks. The game itself had good graphics, there was the classic God of War violence, and the quick time events were pretty fun. But the combat was repetitive, I never felt safe using magic attacks, there was an extreme lack of enemy variety in bosses, there's barely any music or sound effects, but worst of all is the platforming. In this game, Kratos literally controls like a heavy sack of potatoes. Making the player jump these platforms was just mental and physical abuse. The game is also very short, although I'm not sure that's a bad thing considering all the bad things I mentioned a minute ago. Now I will say that the story is somewhat interesting, but ultimately it doesn't matter. God of War Betrayal takes place after Ghost of Sparta. Kratos is angry at the gods, which sends him on a mission to destroy any Greek city he comes across. However, this time around the gods are beginning to get tired of this. So the goddess Hera sends her monster Argos to put a stop to Kratos. But out of nowhere, a mysterious assassin kills Argos and thus framing Kratos for his death. What follows is Kratos chasing the assassin to learn of his identity and most likely kill him. But before he can do that, Hermes' son Serex is sent by Zeus to stop Kratos. Kratos kills him and the assassin gets away. The reason I say this story is somewhat interesting is because through my playthrough, the mystery of who the assassin's identity was kept me engaged through the story. Was it Zeus? Hermes? We still don't have an official answer, which keeps the story being interesting up to this day. But overall, if you ask me, God of War Betrayal is a game that you can skip. It was a good cell phone game for 2007, but sadly it hasn't aged that well for today's standards. Next we have God of War Ascension. And look, it pains me to put God of War Ascension next to God of War Betrayal. The gap in quality between these two titles is the size of the Grand Canyon. But ultimately, when I look at the God of War series as a whole, I regard God of War Ascension as being a little unnecessary. To start things off, the story is a prequel, canonically taking place right at the beginning of the series. And I think this was the game's first mistake. Because the series by this point had already made two prequel games that had done an excellent job at fleshing out Kratos' backstory, leaving God of War Ascension with not much room to cover. And on top of that, Kratos had already killed the entire Greek pantheon in God of War 3, ensuring that whichever villain Kratos fought in Ascension wouldn't be much of a threat. On the gameplay side, God of War Ascension was also beginning to show its age. It came out at a time when hack and slashers just weren't as popular as they were in the early 2000s. But still, as a fan of the series, I can appreciate some of the new additions that were implemented, such as the melee combat, the grapple mechanic, and the disposable weapons. Even some things I initially hated, such as the rage meter, I've come to enjoy more with time. That is, when the camera isn't zooming out a mile away. But most of the other additions just didn't click with me. Instead of getting different weapons, the game gives you different elemental powers, such as ice, soul, and electricity. Each one of them had a purpose in combat, but I never felt truly like I needed to use them to succeed. So for the most part, I just stuck to my fire blades. The game also adapted some bad practices from other popular games at the time, like the climbing. Say goodbye to those fun climbing sections that require you to kill enemies and dodge falling objects. Instead, just press up. Now, I don't want to harp on this game too much, because God of War Ascension did some really cool things that no other God of War game has ever done, like the inclusion of a multiplayer mode. This mode would start by letting you choose which god you wanted to pledge your allegiance to, and depending on which one you picked, you would be able to unlock different magic attacks, weapons, and armors. Back then I didn't think anyone could successfully make a hack and slasher multiplayer game, but that's exactly what Santa Monica did. Things such as traps, huge bosses, and good old violence made it into the multiplayer. 
I'm not gonna lie and say it was the best multiplayer game of 2013, but it gave me and other God of War fans plenty hours of fun. These days I find myself appreciating Ascension a little bit more. Sure, it was for the most part an okay game, but it did some cool things that often get overlooked. Who knows, maybe one day I'll place this game higher in the list. Next we have God of War Chains of Olympus. Much like God of War Betrayal, the team at Ready at Dawn were given the difficult task to capture what had made the first few God of War games special and recreate it for a system that had a lot more limitations. But unlike Betrayal, God of War Chains of Olympus actually succeeded at achieving this goal, as everything I had come to love about the God of War series was present in Chains of Olympus. Beautiful and useful magic attacks? Check. Badass secondary weapon that's actually useful? Check. Awesome bosses? Well, they were pretty good, but still. The story is also one of the best in the series. Once again, much like God of War Betrayal, the mystery of who had taken Helios from the sky kept me on the edge of my seat from beginning to end. It was also refreshing to see Kratos in a different light. Sure, he was still angry at yelling at the gods, but the story here takes place before poop really hits the fan for Kratos. So instead, you get to see a broken Kratos, one that just wants to be free from the nightmares that plague his mind. This, combined with an amazing performance by T.C. Carson, resulted in some of the most memorable moments in the series. But my path is now clear to me. I will serve them! And they will keep their promise to free me from my past! I ask you, Spartan, what good is the promise of an Olympian? It is all I have, Atlas! But look, at the end of the day, this is still a PSP game. While it succeeded for the most part in capturing what had made the God of War series special, there were some things that the system just couldn't handle. For starters, the level design wasn't nearly as complex as previous games. In fact, there were a lot of these arena encounters where the camera just wouldn't let you see if an enemy was about to shoot a projectile, resulting in a lot of guesswork on the player's part. The combat while good, it never felt as buttery as the previous games. It feels like Kratos is constantly walking through molasses. A good example of this was the Evade animation. I don't know if it's just me, but evading in both Chains of Olympus and Ghost of Sparta always felt stiff, as opposed to the clean role Kratos performs in the PS2 games. I don't really have much to complain about this game. Sure, the story was short and the feel of combat wasn't as good as the other games, but for a PSP game, this is still pretty impressive. It's no surprise that this game still holds a beautiful 91 on Metacritic. So if you're just getting into the God of War series, this game is a must. You're just gonna have to buy a PSP or a PlayStation 3 to play it. Hey, now that I mentioned this, how about we get a remaster for the PS5 Sony? It doesn't even have to be a remake, just a re-release would be fine for us. Anyway, let's get to the next game. But before I do, I'm gonna take a little bit of a break. My voice is getting a little bit sore with this list. This is what you came for, is it? Soon after playing God of War Ragnarok, a lot of you were dying to know where I would place it in the ranking of the series. And I always responded with, I don't know. And to this day, I'm still not sure. Some days I think this game belongs in the top 3, while other days I think it should be placed right after God of War Betrayal. And this is because God of War Ragnarok is a game of extremes. There's a lot of things I absolutely love about this game, and the things I don't like, I hate them with a passion. But like I've been doing up to this point, let's start with the positives. God of War Ragnarok easily has one of the best combat systems in the series, maybe even one of the best combat systems of all time. This was achieved by adding new features such as the Whiplash and Frost Awaken skills, two new mechanics that I truly needed to use to succeed in combat. The game also improved its enemy variety. No longer were you just fighting humanoid creatures. There are Stalkers, Wyverns, Enherge Jar Captains, Drekkies, Flame Phantoms, and way more that now rank for me as one of the best in the series. The game also has some truly amazing bosses. That initial fight with Thor was everything I wanted and more. The huge scale seen in the Garn boss fight was something I initially thought stayed in the past with older God of War games. But Santa Monica somehow managed to do it in this game with no cuts in the camera. Oh, and can we talk about those smooth camera transitions? Other boss fights such as the final fight with Thor and Odin were criticized for not having any spectacle. And while I see where fans are coming from, I don't really care that much. Because these are some of the most technical fights in the game as they truly make you use all of the skills you learned up to that point. Santa Monica also stepped up their game with its side content. Mimir's side quest in Spartelheim has its own dedicated environment. Freya's side mission has one of the most emotional moments in the series. And have you seen the crater? I always see fans asking for a nice, chunky DLC. But why? Just go to the crater, fight enemies exclusive to that region, and learn more about Faye's past. What more do you need? 
Look, there's honestly too many positive things I could go on about, but I would never finish the video. So I'm just gonna list a couple more. The game has an amazing art direction. Atreus's combat is surprisingly good. The drop near spear is easily the best side weapon in the series. The soundtrack is also the best in the series. Yes, you heard me right. The best in the series. I mean, just listen to this. Don't act like you know me. At this point I'm tired of repeating myself, but I'll do it again. God of War Ragnarok is a great game, and it's no wonder it received so many awards. However, as much polished and great things this game has, I have to be honest, God of War Ragnarok left me somewhat disappointed. And I think this disappointment stems from the infamous decision to finish the Norse Saga in two games instead of three. There's no doubt in my mind that God of War Ragnarok has one of the best, if not the best story of 2022. But the decision to finish the Norse Saga in two games was a bad idea. Maybe not a bad idea for the studio, but a bad idea for the story of the series. It's clear to me that the Norse Saga was originally conceived with the idea of there being three games. Three games to have enough time to develop all of these characters properly. Something God of War Ragnarok failed to do with characters such as Freya and Thor. Thor was barely in the game, and Freya's turn to the good side just happened because the plot demanded it without any proper build up for it to feel memorable in any way. It's clear to me that originally there was going to be a sequel that delved deeper into the character of Freya as well as Thor's, while the third game would focus on Odin and Ragnarok. But instead, God of War Ragnarok tries to be both games at the same time, and this is why the story doesn't feel as cohesive as the first. I can tell some sections in this game were 100% shoehorned, like that whole section when Kratos and Freya are looking for the Norns. Why are they looking for the Norns again? Is it to change Kratos or Atreus' destiny? Nope, it's so Kratos can ask them where Atreus is even though he already knows he's most likely in Asgard. Sections like these were rushed to make time for more important moments, like Ragnarok itself, but even those came out feeling rushed and unfinished. Look, Santa Monica has become a master at creating deep and truly interesting characters that rival even those of Naughty Dog. Some moments in this game truly had me crying my eyes out, and ultimately, they succeeded at finishing Kratos and Atreus' arc. But the sequel to God of War 2018 deserved more than what we got. What happened to the horn? The dragons we freed, what was Jörmungandr really saying? Why was the world out of balance when Atreus got mad? These are questions that still plague the minds of many God of War fans. And it's a shame we won't get answers for quite some time. Now, this next criticism is something I know every old God of War fan will agree with me, while the new ones might not. But let's have a go at it anyway. The tone of a game with the word Ragnarok in its title should not be as goofy as it was in this game. Sure, the game had the deep and emotional moments we've all come to expect, but there's just too many characters that totally don't belong in a God of War game. Skjolder and Throod sound like kids from California, Lunda made me go get a rubber ball, and Freyr? <laughs> Freyr's straight up Nathan Drake. Yeah. I didn't want to listen. Now I need to say that these aren't necessarily bad characters. They are quite well written, they just don't fit with the God of War brand. Especially when the word Ragnarok is in its title. What, you wanted to see the impending doom of the realms as gods and giants went to war with each other? Nah, let's have moments like this instead. Uh, I'm just messing around. Of course he means to betray me, huh? Kind all. Overall, the situation with God of War Ragnarok makes me truly sad. The reason I've talked more about this game than any other up to this point is because I see the potential for greatness. The combat, bosses, optional areas, and music are some of the best in the industry. But if Santa Monica had taken their time and made a trilogy, the Norse Saga could stand alongside other great trilogies like Halo, Lord of the Rings, and even Star Wars. But instead, what we got was a really good game, but also a bit of a rushed mess. And that's all I got to say for now. Much like Ascension, someday I might place this game higher on the list. But today, I'm still salty about Ironwood. The next game on my list has to be God of War Ghost of Sparta easily the most underrated game in the series, which is understandable since this game came out shortly after God of War 3. But once you actually get to play it, you will be treated to one of the best stories in the series. I'll even go as far as saying that if you were to remove Ghost of Sparta from the series, the older game story would suffer a little bit for it. Because as much as I love God of War 2's story, Kratos as a character made a big jump from his character in God of War 1. Ghost of Sparta was that much needed transition from God of War 1 Kratos to God of War 2 Kratos. This was achieved by giving us an angry Kratos that was also questioning his recent allegiance to the gods of Olympus. 
all the while taking the players on a journey to uncover the secret of the marked warrior prophecy. It may not have an Oscar winning story, but it is by far the most entertaining in the series. You can give me any cutscene from this game and I'll be on it like, like moss, moss on a, on a Mississippi, Mississippi tree, tree trunk. And I think this is because Ghost of Sparta's tone is the darkest in the series. While God of War Ragnarok had scenes like this, Ghost of Sparta had scenes that would send shivers down my spine. Awaits the ghost. <coughs> will never get the skull. The skull. Now, in terms of gameplay, I don't have much to say. This was Ready at Dawn's second entry in the series, and you could tell that they had enough time in between games to really improve their tech. Additions like Kratos' Charge and the Arms of Sparta were clear improvement over the previous title, but I don't think they were revolutionary enough to be selling points. On the other hand, I would say that graphically, Ghost of Sparta is one of the best in the series. I know I haven't talked about the graphics of any game up to this point, and that's because we expect PS2 and PS5 games to look a certain way. But graphics in a PSP were never something people drool over. But when it comes to Ghost of Sparta, oh no, Ready or Dawn hit it out of the park. Just look at this scenery. This game doesn't have the right to look this good. For Ghost of Sparta, I don't have that many negative things to say, because they pretty much are the same as Chains of Olympus. The bosses are okay, the enemy variety is not the best, the camera sometimes still works against the player, and the feel of gameplay still isn't as tight as the home consoles. But I will say that they were a little bit improved. The only exclusive problem God of War Ghost of Sparta had was its third act, as it felt really rushed. In one scene, Demos is beating the crap out of Kratos, and in the other, they are best bros. I feel like the game needed a level in between these two moments to make this change of character more believable. But other than that, Ghost of Sparta was a great experience. Its only real flaws was the limitations of its system. If the game's combat felt a little smooth like God of War 3's, I would probably place this game at the number one spot. So what are you waiting for? Go and play it. Oh, yeah, that's right, you, you can't play them on the PS5. Did I mention that you should re-release these games on the PS5? Anyway, moving on to the next entry and we have good old God of War 2018, the game that pretty much gave birth to this channel. If you watched my previous ranking video, you might have noticed that this game was a little bit higher on the list. So why is it that it finds itself so low on this list? Look, God of War 2018 was a huge breath of fresh air for the series. Sure, the high and octane spectacle of the previous games was great, but seeing Kratos and Atreus slowly develop their relationship as father and son was a spectacle in and of itself. I never thought a character that made faces like this could ever be portrayed in a fatherly role, but Santa Monica didn't just do that. They took those very same early 2000s edgy video game depictions of Kratos and made him part of the story. Every moment, every character was carefully planted to maximize the effectiveness of its beautiful ending. The story itself isn't that complex. Kratos and Atreus need to go to the highest peak in all the realms to say one final goodbye to Faye. But this is enough fuel to set the adventure in motion, and my god, what an adventure it was. While the art style abandoned the look of Greek architecture and settled for a more grounded vision, I think it ultimately worked in this game's favor, as every moment felt like Kratos and Atreus were bringing to life a dead world. I will always remember moments like meeting Freya, Jormungandr, and Mimir, the first three characters in the God of War series not to have an end like this. But by far the most interesting character was Baldur. To this day, he is still my favorite villain in the series. Brutal like any god Kratos had fought before, but also a tortured soul that players could sympathize with. Something that had never been done in the series up to this point. Now, while the most important thing in story-driven games like this is the story, Santa Monica didn't let its bread and butter go moldy, if you will. Sure, the combat was a little bit slower than before, but getting to play around with the Leviathan Axe callback ability was something I had never experienced before. And when they gave me the Blades of Chaos again, oh, I was set for the entire journey. But look, as good as this game is, we also have to talk about the bad practices it started. Much like Ascension, it followed the tradition of just pushing up to climb. There were a lot of sections where the game would also force you to slow down. I'm not sure why, the dialogue and writing in this game is so good that I would naturally stop whenever Kratos and Atreus were talking. It made me feel like a fly on the wall listening into their conversation. The slowness in these sections will not be noticed in a first playthrough, but after a second one, you'll be begging for that fast forward remote Adam Sandler uses in Grown Ups or one of his crappy movies. And I know I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this, but here we go again. I hate this, this, 
All of this modern day RPG clutter is so anti God of War to me. I understand the game wasn't as linear as the previous games in the past, so naturally they had to reward the player with something. But an enchantment that gives you 30 plus defense against Dark Elves in Niflheim is not it. To be fair, sometimes they would give you a cool new runic attack for your weapons, which was kinda cool. And this next criticism is kinda like the other face of the coin of something I said while talking about God of War Ragnarok. Now when I go back to this game, something that sticks out to me is the graveyard of thesis that we never got an answer to. To quote Odin, why did you do that? What was it Somebody all for? Somebody just called the serpent. You choose to be nothing! This is sad because I'm starting to see that the more story-driven games in this series are more connected to each other. This is really good when you as a consumer are happy with both stories. But in my case, who didn't enjoy the story and characters of Ragnarok that much, now when Mimir talks about Odin in this game, this is the image I see. But anyway, let's end on a positive note. Sure, God of War 2018 had some issues. But overall, my experience with it was something I never expected the God of War series to provide. A rich emotional story between a father and son overcoming their problems to emerge as stronger people by the end. And also, Kratos was still kicking butt in this game. Following God of War, we have God of War, the game that started it all. I still remember being 10 years old and popping this beast in a rented PlayStation 2. From the moment the game started, I knew this game was going to be special. When it comes to gameplay, I had never experienced such smooth controls. The blades and powers Kratos used always felt accessible to link with each other. The bosses was something I had never seen either. They weren't just all about hitting them, as all of them had a puzzle element that required you to think outside the box on how to defeat them. The story was also spectacular, but not due to its complexity. The story in and of itself was simple, retrieve Pandora's box to defeat the God of War. But what was special is how we got to learn about Kratos' backstory, that being the iconic flashback scenes. As the game progressed, the story would slowly fill in the picture of Kratos' past. The flashbacks always repeat some scenes from the previous flashbacks as well as adding new ones. This was done so people who had a busy schedule could always know where they were in this story. This might not seem like a big deal to some of you, because I'm sure the moment you started playing this game, there was no stopping. You sat there on the couch until you finished it. But not me. I had to wait until I managed to get 40 pesos so I could rent a PlayStation 2 again for the day. So Jaffe, if you're watching this, I really appreciate the approach to the narrative in this game. Now when it comes to the negatives of this game, it's hard for me to be 100% objective. Because I've played this game so many times that the jank new player's experience is not there for me. I see a lot of people complaining about the Hades level, for example. Even the director has admitted that this section needed to be tested more. But me, I have a lot of fun playing in it, as this is one of the few sections in the game that still challenges me to this day. Being able to walk on one of these spinning platforms without falling is a badge of honor that not many God of War fans can claim. In fact, I will say that one thing I truly miss about this game is the platforming. I know we give new God of War games a hard time for not having any platforming, but the truth is, after God of War 1, the importance of platforming sections started to go down. God of War 2 didn't have nearly as much, and I honestly can't remember a single one from God of War 3. But God of War 1 is full of these moments where your reflexes and skills will be tested to the max. I will say, the camera sometimes can be a pain in the butt, as it can change in a dime making you fall, or worst of all, flat out kill you in certain enemy encounters. The level design is also a little bit outdated. You can tell by its obvious Resident Evil style of walking for an hour until you find the skull that unlocks the next section. The secret rooms that can be opened with Muse's key is cool though, I wish something like this could return in the future. Hey, it kinda did with the well and the crater. Good for you, God of War Ragnarok. Overall, God of War 1 is a bit outdated, but still one of the greatest action-adventure games of all time, as in my opinion, it does the best job in the series at combining story and gameplay in a satisfying manner. And for that, we will always remember it. Now, on the number 2 spot, we have God of War 3. Oh boy, where to start? God of War 3 is hack and slasher royalty. Not only did Kratos' iconic blades return, but Santa Monica also gave us a plethora of tools to aid us in our quest to combo every living thing in the Greek pantheon. There was Helios Head that can blind enemies as well as reveal secrets, the Boots of Hermes that allow you to charge your enemies with the speed of, well, Hermes. The Bow of Apollo was pretty much a reskin of Ebony and Ivory from Devil May Cry, meaning it doesn't do as much damage, but it does help you keep the enemies up in the air for longer periods of time. There were also three awesome new weapons that admittedly felt a little similar to the Blades but they still had a gimmick of some kind that would set them apart from each other. The Claws of Hades allowed you to pick a soul of a monster to aid you in battle. The Nemesis Whip was good for extending combos. And the Nemean Cestus, they were just cool. 
I don't think you can complain about a single thing from God of War 3's combat. Maybe having your magic attacks linked to specific weapons was a little bit annoying, but I can give Santa Monica a pass since they made sure no button on the controller went unused. The bosses in this game aren't just incredible, they are some of the best gaming has ever offered. You have your more personal and in your fate fights like Zeus and Hercules, but you also get incredible scale and spectacle with bosses like Poseidon and Kronos. Now, let's talk a little bit about this story. The story of God of War 3 is far from being perfect. By the time this game came out, Kratos' complexity as a character had truly been eroded. While God of War 1 and Chains of Olympus gave you a deep look at a broken man, here you witness a man breaking everything. Some of the things Kratos does in this game are so vile that I don't even know how they pass the censor. The funny thing is that moments after committing this revolting crime, Santa Monica gives you a cutscene where Kratos is shown to care for Pandora like his own daughter. I understand since the start of the game, Pandora was slowly changing Kratos, but his closeness to her at the end felt a little bit rushed. Similar to the demo's change of heart in Ghost of Sparta, the clear solution would have been to introduce Pandora from the beginning of the story. That way, she could slowly start reminding Kratos of his humanity. Oh wait, doesn't that sound a little like God of War 2018's story? To me, this clearly shows the different approach and design philosophies between old God of War games and new ones. The new ones play story first, even if some core gameplay features have to be cut, such as platformings, underwater sections, and constantly getting new cool weapons and powers. While the old God of War games are a little bit lighter on the story and character development, so they have more freedom to add cool new gameplay mechanics. He didn't have to kill Hermes this way, but this way provided him with a really cool mechanic. The same with the Kronos encounter. Why exactly is Kratos in need of a new weapon? He has the Blades of Exile, the Claws of Hades, the Nemean Cestus, and the blade that ended the Great War itself. Why does he need a new weapon? He doesn't, but Santa Monica knew this detour would be worth it because it would give the player one of the coolest encounters in gaming history. God of War 3 leaves me torn, because I know the story isn't its strongest suit, but the things the game makes you do are so damn fun that I'm willing to overlook those story issues. And when it comes to games, Gameplay comes first, and that's why God of War 3 finds itself at the prestigious number 2 spot. But of course, now we have to talk about the game I consider the best in the series, God of War 2. After God of War 1, I didn't know how Santa Monica could improve the sequel, but when this beast came out, it was a game changer. From the very beginning, the game offers one of the best openings in video game history. Kratos is angry at the gods and is actively destroying any Greek city he comes across. Zeus doesn't like this, so he siphons some of his powers and gives it to the Colossus of Rhodes. I don't know what it is, but I just find statues really cool. I swear it's not a kink. Although that wet statue in God of War 3... <laughs> but give me the gift to fight one of the coolest statues in history is sure to make it into my core memories folder. But the intro didn't stop there, because once Zeus reveals himself to be behind it all, he straight up kills Kratos, the protagonist. I'm not saying God of War 2 was the first game to do this, but it was definitely the first time I saw it. Now, an issue almost every God of War game has is that soon after the introduction is finished, the excitement in the game drastically drops. Ragnarok has the Svartalheim level, God of War 1 has Athens, God of War 3 has Hades, and God of War Ascension has the entire game. But with God of War 2, the game immediately gives you a Pegasus section that I personally find really fun. Following that, you go to the icy caverns where Typhon is being imprisoned to receive the fire of Olympus. It's just one seamless adventure that never seems to let your attention wander off. The game does this by constantly changing its beautiful locations. You will go to the Sisters of Fate Temple, the Bog of the Forgotten, the Temple of Uriley, the Underworld. I mean, look at these shiny PlayStation 2 floors and tell me you don't want to lick them. And I think this is what God of War 2 does best. No, nope, not the shiny floors but giving the players a great sense of adventure. God of War 3 feels like Santa Monica was giving us a checklist of gods Kratos needed to kill by the end of the story. But every character you encounter in God of War 2 has the same goal as Kratos. They all want to change your destiny for one reason or another. Kratos isn't necessarily evil towards them. He always gives them a chance to live. It's only when they get in his way that he's forced to brutally murder them. Now, while the combat in God of War 2 isn't as tight as God of War 3's, it's no slouch either. How the blades feel are much better compared to God of War 1. The game also gave us more useful tools such as Typhon's Bow, Kronos Rage, Atlas Quake, and even Medusa's head was more fun to use in this game. Although I will say the side weapons are a little bit meh. I know I'm actively pissing off Sesti by saying this, but I just hate the Spear of Destiny. I'm coming around the Barbarian Hammer, but I just, I can't stomach the Spear. 
God of War 2 also has some great boss battles. I mentioned the Colossus, but there's also the Barbarian King, Zeus, the Kraken, and my favorite boss battle in the entire series, the Sisters of Fate. For those of you who've never played this game, listen to me now. When you get to the Atropos section in the fight, let her win. I'm not going to show you what happens here, but trust me, let her win. It'll be worth it. Look, let me end it like this. God of War 2 doesn't have the best story, it doesn't have the best bosses, it doesn't even have the best combat. What's great about God of War 2 is how it paces all of these things in a very enjoyable manner. I don't think there's a single moment in God of War 2 that I find boring. And when it comes to single player games, that's the most important thing. That's why God of War 2, in my opinion, is the best game in the series. So there you have it guys, my updated ranking of the God of War series. What did you think? Was I too hard on God of War Ragnarok? Let me know in the comments section below by leaving your very own ranking. The good thing about the God of War series is that there's not a single game that's unplayable. Well, we do have Betrayal, but still, every God of War game has something special that will speak to each of you, meaning that every ranking you will see in the comments section is just as valid as the next. Now, before I go, I want to give a big thanks to all of my members for supporting the channel monthly. If it wasn't for people like Omega Fantasy, Matt Slode, Ivan Davila, Just Give Me God of War, and Khalib Parker to name a few, I couldn't take as long as I did to make this video. So from the bottom of my heart guys, thank you. I would also like to thank everyone who likes and shares my videos. I know it doesn't seem like much, but trust me, it really does help. And with that said, thanks for watching, and remember, go forth in the name of Olympus.